green plants, their leaves soaking up the sun. The sun's rays bathe our planet. Chlorophyll in plant leaves and other green tissues captures the energy of sunlight to be used in photosynthesis, a biochemical process that fuels the growth of the plant. Water is drawn up from roots into the leaves where, using light energy, it is combined with CO2 from the surrounding air and carbohydrate sugars are formed that are used to create the plant's tissues. Excess oxygen is released from leaves to the atmosphere. That's how most plants work, including trees. The sugars are used to build more leafy growth. And roots. Flowers. Fruits. Seeds. And in the case of woody plants, the actual wood itself. Most plants have an ally attached to their roots the mycelium of mycorrhizal fungi. Various species of mycorrhizal fungi encase the root tips of plants. The fungal mycelium acts as a vast extension of the plant's roots, supplying water and nutrients to the plant while extracting sugars from the plant for its own use. A symbiotic relationship where both plant and fungus benefit. This is how a forest operates. But some plants have something different attached to their roots. Other plants. Many millions of years ago, some plants developed a modified root structure called a hostorium, which was able to penetrate the roots of other plants and tap into the xylem, those vessels that conduct water from the roots. They could then extract water and dissolve minerals from the host plant while still producing their own food through photosynthesis. These plants were cheating and are known as hemiparasites or partial parasites. Where there are oak trees, there may be a number of hemiparasite plants attaching to their roots. This is fern-leaved false foxglove. It's a hemiparasite. Because it's green, it does photosynthesize but it's also a partial parasite on oak roots and must attach to an oak in order to survive, flower, and reproduce. Below ground, oak roots give off compounds that parasite plants detect, triggering them to form hostoria to penetrate the oak roots. Fern-leaved false foxglove has similar looking related species, such as smooth false foxglove. This plant grows in dry, sandy, or rocky soils.
It's a hemiparasite on trees in the white oak group. And right nearby is a dwarf chinkapin oak, a member of the white oak group. There are eight North American species of yellow false foxgloves in the Aureolaria genus. By the amount of green photosynthetic surfaces in these tall plants, it's easy to think they have no need to be parasites. But some of their relatives might give a different impression. In New England, there are six species of false foxgloves in the Agalinus genus, like this small-flowered false foxglove. These plants are wispy, with narrow leaves only two millimeters wide or so. It's easier to believe these plants need to steal some food, and they do so from nearby plants. They typically prefer moist, sandy sites. This one is losing some of its food to another parasite, aphids. The flowers of Agalinus are purple and quite small, lasting only one day before falling off. Occasionally, flowers may be white, red, or pink. In early spring, a perennial plant is growing in this grassy meadow. It's Canadian lousewort, a hemiparasite that attaches to roots of grasses and other plants. It can also be found in forests. But in meadows, it can help to reduce the dominance of fast-growing grasses, allowing a broader mix of plants to grow there. For that reason, it's considered a keystone species in wildflower meadow restoration projects. It also has a symbiotic relationship with a fungus through which it obtains nutrients. Another plant found in meadows is little yellow rattle. This is a non-native annual that photosynthesizes, but is happiest when it parasitizes grasses, as well as many other plants. It too is used to reduce heavy grass cover in wildflower meadow restorations. Each year it grows in dense patches, reducing heavy grass cover like this to a more varied mix of plants. Next year, the patch will arise in a different spot, creating a moving matrix of diversity. Found in meadows and roadsides, common eye bright is a small annual hemiparasitic plant that also gets much of its nutrition from the roots of grasses. It grows to a foot or more in height from a tap root. Moving away from grasslands to dry open sites with low bush blueberries or young forests of aspens or even red oak and pine woods, we may find another annual hemiparasitic plant. This is narrow leaf cow wheat. Although it does photosynthesize its own food, it cannot produce flowers or fruits unless it can tap into a host. Let's follow one of its roots. And it leads us to the point where it created a hostorium connected to a root of another plant, in this case, probably an oak tree. Some parasitic roots may have to travel a little farther to find a suitable host root.
Lifting it with a needle shows it to be solidly attached to the host root. Hemiparasites developed millions of years ago. Then, some plant species evolved to become complete parasites, extracting not only water, but sugars as well. They're known as holoparasites. To varying degrees, they lost parts of their genetic code and no longer contained much, if any, chlorophyll. They lost their green color and could photosynthesize very little or not at all. Leaves were lost or reduced to small scaly structures. They depend entirely on other plants or fungi for nutrients and water. A colorful meadow of goldenrod in autumn. Visit in spring and you may find this holoparasite. One flowered cancer root. Goldenrod is one of the many plants it parasitizes. Notice this annual plant has no leaves or green color. It lives primarily underground, only sending up a flowering stalk to produce seeds. It can be found in many habitats, including forests, but usually only does well where there is a thick growth of host plants. Because it doesn't photosynthesize, it can be found in heavily shaded situations, a trait common to many holoparasites. In springtime, oak forests are where you'll find another holoparasite. Bear corn, or American cancer root. Here, it's in flower. Soon the flowers fade and seed capsules appear, making the plant look like an ear of corn. Previously, bear corn seeds had germinated and formed woody nodules on the oak roots underground. It takes about four years to produce the first above-ground, cone-like structures. They'll sprout from the nodules for several years, then the bear corn dies. Large, beautiful, healthy American beech trees, known for their smooth bark. They've now become a rare find in much of the beach's range due to a blight called beach bark disease, which has devastated beach forests for decades. The once remarkably smooth bark develops blisters and cracks. Trees slowly die, break apart and fall. And, since 2012, a beech leaf disease has been spreading to many states as well. It's caused by a microscopic nematode worm that destroys the leaves. The nematode overwinters in leaf buds and starts eating the leaves before the buds even open. But, if you can still find healthy American beech trees, you may also find beech drops, a small plant that parasitizes them. Tiny beech drop seeds in the soil germinate only when activated by a chemical signal 
from beech roots a few millimeters away. They grow short, specialized hostoria roots that penetrate the beech roots and feed exclusively off the tree's roots. As an underground beech drop tubercle grows just below the surface, it sends up an above ground shoot. Since they must be attached to the tree's roots, beech drops will never be found far from a beech tree. In late summer, beech drops produce flowers of two types. Those on the lower portion of the plant are cleistogamous meaning they never open and are self-pollinated. These ensure that seeds will be produced, but without cross-pollination, no genetic diversity gets introduced, limiting adaptability. The upper flowers are chasmogamous. They open and may be pollinated by other plants if insect pollinators visit. But oddly, they're known to often be sterile, Seeds of cross-pollinated flowers allow more adaptability through mixing of genes from other beech drop plants. Some beech drop plants are a golden yellow, others are more red and brown. By itself, beech drop does little harm to healthy trees, but as the beeches are dying off, beech drops are disappearing with them. Mycelium, the main body of fungus, is everywhere in the forest duff layer. Mycorrhizal fungus networks interconnect most forest plants and trees to others. There's another group of plants that tap into mycelium instead of plant roots, so they get their nutrients indirectly from other plants via the fungus. They're referred to as mycoheterotrophs, meaning they get their nutrients from a fungus. A moist bottomland site with a rich humus layer, home to ferns, mosses, and mushrooms. A tiny orchid grows here. It can be very hard to notice, even in the open conditions of early spring. This is the early or northern coral root, which appears in spring. It can photosynthesize to a small degree, but primarily gets nutrition from the mycelium of mycorrhizal fungi so its nutrients are passed from living plants through the fungus to the coral root. They're called coral roots because their roots resemble coral. Growing in somewhat drier upland sites with little ground cover is the related spotted coral root. This plant is a handsome orchid that has no green chlorophyll and does not photosynthesize. Appearing in summer, it too gets its nutrition from mycorrhizal fungi. After flowering, the plant may not appear again for several years, living just as an underground rhizome. About the time wintergreen is flowering, the ghost plant, or Indian pipe, emerges in mature, shaded forests. Indian pipe is another mycoheterotroph. It contains no chlorophyll, so it cannot photosynthesize. All of its nutrients are taken from Rosula and Lactarius mycorrhizal fungi, which are connected to tree roots. When this perennial first emerges, the single flower atop its translucent white stalk is nodding downward. 
Once it has been pollinated by an insect, the flower rises skyward until it points directly up. Where Indian pipes are found, you know there are mycorrhizal fungi in the ground, whether their mushrooms are visible or not. Mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of the mycelium. The fungal mycelium is connected in a mutually beneficial relationship to tree roots, extracting carbohydrates from the trees and supplying water and minerals to the trees. And the Indian pipe plant is taking some of the nutrients from the mycelium. Instead of using a hostarium directly into plant roots, mycoheterotrophs make the fungus a middleman by tapping into mycelium. Indian pipe roots are just a small mass of spike-like projections. Flower stalks arise from the mass. Some plants are tinged with pink. A related plant is pine sap. It looks nearly identical to Indian pipe, but has more than one flower on a stalk and is usually not ghostly white. Some are creamy yellow. There is a bright red variant known as hairy pine sap. There are rare occurrences in New England of this beautiful plant, pine drops, which is more of a western U.S. plant. It has been found in New Hampshire and Vermont, and recently the first occurrence in western Massachusetts was found. So far, the parasitic plants we've discussed have all been root parasites. There are some that conduct their activities above ground on plant stems. Finding the first of these usually requires a slog into wet habitat. Making your way into a spruce bog like this can be a bit of a challenge and requires tall rubber boots. On surrounding drier ground, red spruce and hemlock trees grow. The hike in may bring you through a luxuriant, green, mossy world. The watery world of black spruce. The margins of the bog are a nearly impenetrable, cluttered tangle of spruces, hemlocks, and shrubs. On a hot summer day, it's a steamy, soggy place to be. Red spruces make it to the bog's edge. But beyond lies a more open bog, home to grasses and wetland shrubs. Here, black spruces perched on mounds of sphagnum moss, replace red spruce. This is where you might find eastern dwarf mistletoe. This peculiar parasitic plant lives inside the twigs of black spruce and other conifer trees. After 2 to 12 years, 
from the start of the infection, dwarf mistletoe will grow aerial flowering stems. This is the only time it's visible. Male and female flowers occur on separate dwarf mistletoe plants. When seeds produced by female flowers mature, they're explosively ejected up to 60 feet away. Seeds are coated with a sticky substance called vicin, which glues them to needles they land on. Rain loosens the bond and the seed slides down to the branch where it germinates and enters the twig. The mistletoe infection interrupts the normal flow of sugars from twigs to lower parts of the tree. Branches, trunk, and roots may be weakened or killed, but parts of the branch beyond the infection may develop thick growth known as a witch's broom. Some are small, some a little larger, and some quite noticeable. They can occur anywhere on the tree. These are seeds of a hollow parasite vine called dadder. Such a tiny seed has extremely little stored energy to start a plant growing. Last year, this seed fell into the soil, and now that it's spring, it has germinated and is growing. Its tiny roots only serve to hold it to the soil while it searches out a green plant to parasitize. It must find a host within a week or two, or it will die. It has no leaves of its own to make food. Using proteins, it effectively sniffs the air for volatile compounds emitted by a suitable host. Unsuitable hosts emit compounds that repel it. When it detects a potential host, it can sense when it's in the shade of the host or in sunlight, which helps direct it toward the host. It may test a number of plants before it finds one it likes. The making of physical contact, along with certain wavelengths of light, trigger it to start winding around the host in a counterclockwise direction. Small adhesive discs called holdfasts are formed that glue the daughter to its host. Now it can sink hostoria and extract food and water. It will attach more hostoria to preferred hosts than to other less desirable hosts. Its connection to the ground now is no longer of any use and withers away. The daughter is now a completely aerial plant. More vines are spreading and sinking hostoria. Peeling one away reveals the holes created by the hostoria. The parasite has grown tissue into the host. Using its newly found supply of nutrients, the daughter branches out to find its next host. It's not very far away.
it can soon overwhelm its hosts. In some cases, a single daughter plant can reportedly attain a total length exceeding 3,000 feet. Host plants start to lose color as they grow weaker. But the daughter is getting stronger, strong enough to produce flowers, while some of its hosts are now nearly dead. Flowers become fruits, and fruits produce seeds for next year. The idea of parasitic versus host plants seems like a victory only for the parasite and a loss only for the host. But a host plant is not entirely helpless. When its tissues are invaded, it will fortify its cell walls and produce compounds that work to repel the invader. Should that not be adequate, the host may preemptively kill some of its own cells surrounding the hostorium. Since the parasite can only extract nutrients from living cells, that may be enough to stop it. However, the parasite may also have the ability to release a variety of chemicals that defeat those defenses. If a parasite such as daughter taps into two different hosts and one of them is being attacked by insects, it may pass chemical information through the daughter vine to the second host, helping it prepare defenses against the attackers. In that case, the second host benefits, but the daughter does too, since the forewarned host will remain stronger and better able to feed the parasite. In photosynthesis, water and dissolved nutrients are drawn up from roots to the leaves. Most of that water is transpired to the atmosphere through microscopic surface pores in the leaves called stomata. Those pores can be closed by the leaves when necessary to control water loss. When a hemiparasite is attached to the roots of a host, pores in its leaves may remain open and constantly pump water from the host. Some theorize the parasite may accumulate surplus dissolved nutrients from that water, which end up concentrated in its leaves. When those leaves fall, other nearby plants benefit from the concentrated nutrients. Approximately 4,800 of the roughly 375,000 known flowering plants, or about 1%, are parasitic. In an agricultural setting, parasitic plants may be detrimental to the production of food crops, but in a natural forest or meadow community, they have their place. Their concentration of nutrients increases soil microbes and invertebrates, with resultant effects all the way up the food chain. Witches' brooms, formed by dwarf mistletoe, are used by a range of animals, from moths and birds to flying squirrels. The grass-suppressing action of Canadian lousewort, little yellow rattle, and eyebright, among others, help keep meadows awash in colorful wildflowers, supporting critically important pollinator insect species. The demise of any individual plants due to a parasite makes room for others, resulting in broader species diversity, essential for a healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm.